why these science-based guys push high frequency. It became the soup of the day many years back. Um, you know, I, it kind of, you, we got into this world of muscle protein synthesis where everybody thought you had to, now let's backtrack and I'm going to show you guys a clip because I like to show this clip. It's very, very important. And while I'm trying to find the clip, uh, I am going to, um, uh, Babylon just for a second, but Back in the day, where this all started was uh, the idea that, you know, muscle protein synthesis after 24 to 48 hours. I want you to listen to this part because it's 48 hours. The idea that after 48 hours, muscle protein synthesis was basically dead in the water, okay? It was dead in the water. And you had to retrain a muscle group to maximize muscle building. Okay, so the idea was the original, you know, bug that was planted in everybody's ear that was after 48 hours, muscle protein synthesis was dead and you had no benefit from training, regardless of how you train. Now, we know this is patent nonsense now, but everybody fell into the boat because everybody what happens in lifting is that something like this will come along and you get a large percentage of people that are afraid of being wrong or afraid of thinking for themselves or using common sense or looking back at the history of lifting and saying this doesn't really jive with what we know to be the history of lifting we know that we went through a whole era where all people used was body part splits. We know, even if you don't like a body part split, we know we went through a whole era where people trained, uh, a lot of people trained twice a week, which goes against the 24 to 48 hour muscle protein synthesis window. We know when we look at the history of lifting that this didn't really line up with the practical results people were getting. So, there's still a lot of uh, residual fear on the part of uh, influencers. When I say they can't think for themselves, you know, it sounds very disrespectful, but we have to apply common sense. I am not trying to say there is one way to train, and you guys that watch this channel understand that. Nothing could be further from the truth. The majority of my clients use a degree of frequency each week but we tailor the frequency to their practical needs because we understand the important part is hard training over time. Now, um, there have been two previous meta-analyses and a meta-analysis looks at all the body of research that basically says when volume is equated, meaning you're getting the same amount of weekly volume, it doesn't matter how you train. Uh, one day a week, you know, it's the weekly volume is Im important and how you slice it up. You do 12 sets of chest a week. You could do 12 on one day. You could do six each on two days. You could do four on three days. It doesn't matter as long as you're training hard and the weekly volume is the same. We had two previous meta analyses that uh, explained this was the case, but still you have people that are just stuck on old ways. Um, and people will always get stuck on old ways. That's not an insult. Um, one thing I find curious is that people will come after me when I try to explain this, uh, you know, in some sort of rational, logical way. That's how grounded people can be in dogma. What I'm about to show you is a clip from Data Driven Strength. And I keep this on my Instagram, and I share this on my Instagram for a reason. Um, this is Josh at Data Driven Strength. And Josh in this clip, which was put out February 11th, nearly two months ago, is talking about a meta-analysis that he did at Data Driven Strength, which was about to come out. I don't know if it came out. 
But what you are about to hear is him explain that frequency does not matter. This is the third meta-analysis that came to this conclusion when, um, when volume was equated. So please take a listen. This is not some random opinion. This is the third meta-analysis on the topic of how frequently should you train. We printed a meta-analysis where we said, okay, if we were to just control for every variable we can, in a training program and just look at the effects of frequency. So the number of times per week, the measured muscle is trained. <clears throat> what are the effects, right? Do higher frequencies lead to greater muscle growth? Do lower frequencies lead to greater muscle growth? Maybe there's some sort of inverted U effect where there is a benefit of higher frequency up to a point, but then it's actually worse, right? So anything's on the table, any sort of relationship is on the table. And basically what we found honestly is a whole lot of nothing right? You can maybe squint and say that going from a frequency of one time per week to a frequency of two times per week does increase your muscle hypertrophy, but that effect was really, really small. And then beyond two times per week, it wasn't worse, but it also wasn't clearly better. Now, again, it's important to keep in mind that that analysis was with everything else controlled for, right? So how close to failure the sets were, and also the total number of sets in the training week. And that's a really important one because in practice, oftentimes if you're training a muscle two or three times a week instead of just one time per week, that's also going to increase the total volume. Okay, so we uh, want to unpack this really quickly. The original, um, the original foundation of you have to train frequently came off the muscle from the muscle protein synthesis era that was preaching 24 to 48 hours basically at that time 48 hours can only be interpreted as uh training a muscle group three times a week right that's basically what it came down to so the big point here was that he said in his meta-analysis there was really no difference between a body part split and a, you know, training two times a week. He said you could squint and maybe see a hair, but over the long run, that hair is not going to matter. And that's what the other meta analyses have stated. And that's where we're at scientific wise. Now, anybody that says they're science based that doesn't, uh, have their grounding in these meta analyses isn't really science-based. They're very dogmatic, and they're just attaching science-based to their name. If we're truly science-based, we're familiar with this reality. And even if we don't believe it or we hypothesize or speculate that there's something else going on, we have to at least say this is the modern science. And we've had three meta-analyses by three different sources that have said the same thing. So I wouldn't say these science-based guys are really truly science-based. Now, he said once you get past two times a week, there is no benefit at all, which absolutely destroys the foundation of the muscle protein synthesis argument. It absolutely crumbles it into a non-argument. So it destroys the whole foundation of where all this came from. The last bit we want to unpack here is that the reason why a lot of these science-based guys, and I'm not air quoting them to be disrespectful, got into the pool of frequency was because when you looked at these frequency studies, what we didn't realize is that they were having the frequency guys perform more weekly volume. Hear this out because this is important. Not all studies, because we can't generalize, but when we did an analysis, a lot of the frequency studies that showed a greater impact in results had more weekly volume. They were making people do more. And you have beginners and you have novices and you have all these people and you have two groups, a body part split and then a frequency. The frequency guys were doing more work. So there was a bias and that's why it showed that the frequency guys were getting more out of it. What we come to understand is that it wasn't the frequency at all. It was the weekly volume. When the weekly volume is the same, and we're not 
advocating a higher weekly volume. We're advocating hard training and evolving volume based on needs. When the weekly volume is the same between a body part split and training a body part one and a half times per week and two times per week and two and a half times per week and three times per week or five times per week in the drunk Russian, when the volume is the same, it does not matter how you train. That is what the modern science says. That is what each of the three meta-analyses over the last three to four years have said. Uh, and some people don't like to hear this, but that's their problem. And, uh, you know, we're not, tr I'm not trying to be biased here. I'm not trying to be dogmatic. I'm trying to tell you guys what I believe is the important thing based on my opinion of what I've seen as someone that has studied training, uh, you know, my whole entire adult life and based laying that side by side with the science is that it doesn't matter how you train. But the important thing here is that we focus on hard training. We focus on the massive iron pillars of success. I put together in my book, Massive Omnibus, and you can find that at superlivingtoday.com. And my original book, Massive Iron, had the pillars of success. What are the pillars of success? They say that we don't have to worry about programs. We don't have to worry about frequency. We don't have to worry about specific exercises. There are thir certain pillars that exist that we need to worry about. And if we follow these pillars, we will be successful regardless of training program, regardless of frequency, regardless of exercise selection. So what are these pillars of success? Number one, that you have hard training in the mix, okay? You are trying to train hard. Yesterday I posted on social media, we're trying to beat the logbook. We're trying to improve. We're, we're, we're trying to get as much out of every set as we can. My first book, Massive Iron, it's probably 11 years old by now. Uh, I talked about maximizing every set. What I spoke about back then was to maximize your progress, you want to go into the gym and try to maximize or get everything you can out of every set. And what I said in my book specifically is if you maximize every set, you're going to maximize every workout. And if you maximize every workout, you're going to maximize the muscle building process. So the foundation is hard training or the mentality that I'm going to get everything I can out of a set. Now, you also need progressive overload. You need, we aren't chasing one rep max strength. We're chasing improvement over time. And that's a different thing. At the end of the day, though, you will not get close to your max natural potential if you aren't a lot stronger than when you started. So the fairy tale that you can build a lot of muscle without progressively overloading and getting a lot stronger than you are now is simply that, a fairy tale. You can't continue to use the same weight on side lateral raises for 10 years and think that just because um, <clears throat> you're doing them with some form of intensity technique and never increasing the weight that you're going to get mass out of that, you won't. So we have hard training, we have progressive overload, we have consistency, which is a huge pillar, and we can kind of brush that off and say, yeah, of course we need to be consistent, but how many people are really consistent with their approach when it comes to hard training and progressive overload and nutrition? We need a reasonable volume. What is a reasonable volume? You start with something that works for your schedule. How many days a week can you train? Three, four, five, whatever. You start with a reasonable volume based on, you know, that foundation of pragmatism. What can I train hard in that period of time? And then we evolve volume based on needs or we evolve our programming based on needs. I'm doing Pendley rows and I don't like eight rep sets. Maybe I change those from three of eight to four sets of six. Is it a reasonable swap? If it's a reasonable swap, that's evolving training based on needs. So you need a reasonable volume and you need a reasonable exercise selection. We are not focused on one specific exercise. I have to do squats. I have to do leg press. I have to do hack squats. I have to do lunges. Any influencer, and I want you to remember this, 
that goes on this box called YouTube or this box called Instagram and tells you that any exercise is magic for hypertrophy is lying to you. They do not understand the nature of hypertrophy. There are no magic exercises. There are no magic splits. There are no magic progression approaches. What you need rather than a magic exercise is a quality selection of exercises. We understand that we need a reasonable weekly volume, and we need a reasonable selection of exercises, impactful exercises. We need exercises that feel good for us, that don't beat up our body, that don't get us injured, that give us a good feel and stress in the areas we're trying to stress, and we need exercises that have a progressive overload opportunity. You can't have a selection of exercises that don't allow for progression. You need some big hitters, some exercises that have a progression opportunity. So we also need things like patience. We need things like focus bulking. These are the pillars of success. And if you have these in place, and again, you can find them at my book, Massive Iron, or the updated version, Massive Omnibus, at my website, superlivingtoday.com. I also have a free PDF. I'm not just trying to sell you crap. I have a free PDF on the Massive Iron Pillars of Success. If you have these in place, frequency doesn't matter. Workouts don't matter. Exercises don't matter. Your progressive overload opportunity or approach doesn't matter. All that matters is hard training and nailing these pillars. And if you think this is bullshit, lay this side by side compared to every lifter in the past 70 years. They all train differently. They all have a different exercise selection. They all have a different way of approaching progressive overload. They all have different splits and they all have different frequencies. So I ask you, the next time this comes up, who is in the right corner? The centrists that look at the history of training and try to analyze the commonalities or the pillars of success, or the bullshit artists who are making money off of pushing magic splits, magic exercises, magic frequencies, magic rest in between sets, and all other kinds of bullshit. It is for you to decide, but that is my case.